Okay, um, yeah, welcome to the very first seminar at Equipro. Um, I mean, online <laughs> seminar at Equipro group at the, at the IBS. Um, yeah, today we have Jack Lim um, from Caltech, who's now a graduate student working with David Conlon. Um, yeah, and he's going to talk about his recent result uh, with David on the sum of uh, linear transformations. joined work with David Conlon. Uh, our first student here in Caltech, but I guess it's second student in Korea. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's let's just talk about a uh, sum of dilates. So I think uh, most of you should be familiar with sum sets, right? So so for sum of dilates, uh, if you have a subset A of a ring R and elements lambda 1 to lambda k, then you can define this sum of dilates, lambda 1 times k and so on, which is what you expect. That's, 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 that's giving me, is, oh, the microphone working well? The volume is very low. Right, there are problems. Uh, the volume is quite low, so... I think it's my mic. Okay. Yeah, hold it closer. Is this better? Um, test, test. Just a little bit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I have to speak louder. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so... This is the sum of dilates. And a uh, uh, natural question to ask is, so just in, in the ring, the real numbers, and you have k real numbers, lambda 1 to lambda k, what is the minimum size of lambda 1a plus and so on up to lambda k times a in terms of the size of a? So the simplest example would be just A plus A, which we know to be at most two, twice of A minus one. And the next non-trivial example is just A plus two times A. So, and the result by book solves this uh, when all the lambdas are integers so he gets that it's at least a constant times a where the constant is the sum of the absolute values of the lambda and later shakan improved the the error the error term into a, just a constant so right so this in the theorem, uh, we need a condition that the integers are all co-prime, because if they're not co-prime, then you can just simply divide them by their GCD, and it'll be the same size. So, and also, uh, the the result is tight, because if you just take a to be an interval, then you get equality up to the the linear term. Okay, so let's extend the problem to linear transformations instead. So now you have k linear transformations in d dimensions, and you have a finite set in z to the d. Now, what is the minimum size of this sum of linear transformations? So, and a conjecture by book is that uh, it is at least this, this constant times A, where it's uh, the sum of the determinants of the linear transformation to the one over D and whole thing raised to the D. So where did this uh, linear term comes from? 
So it comes from the Bloom-Minkowski inequality. So um, let's recall that the Bloom-Minkowski inequality says that if you have two non-empty complex subsets in R to the D, then the volume of A plus of A1 plus A2 can be lower bounded by, by this inequality here. And uh, an inequality case is when A1 and A2 are homothetic. And you can see that, yeah, this indeed holds when they're homothetic. Right. So now notice that if, um, back to the discrete problem, if you take A to be uh, a convex set, in R to the D intersected with the lattice grid, then you expect that uh, the number of points of A1 is about the volume of A1, and the number of points in A1 plus A2 is about the volume of A1 plus A2. And when you take L of A, the volume of A gets multiplied by the determinant. So, so yeah, so in the two summon case, we get, we get this result here. When, when A is a, a compact set in R to the D. And yeah, it's, so that's how the, that's where the conjecture comes from. So here's the conjecture again. So note, note that the, in the conjecture, there's two conditions there. One is that they have no common non-trivial invariant subspace. And the other is that L1 of Z to the D and so on up to LK of Z to the D must be the whole lattice. So the first condition is necessary, right? Because if there is a, there is a common non-trivial subspace, then you can restrict all the linear transformations into that subspace. Then it becomes a lower dimensional problem. And for the second condition, if the sum is not the whole lattice grid Z to the D, then it must be in a smaller sub lattice. But then you see that L1 of A plus up to LK of A, we have sort of density less than one. So this is like the co-prime analog, but in higher dimensions. Okay, so it turns out that actually both conditions are insufficient. So, so in, for the first example, let's consider L1 and L2 to be rotation by 90 degrees. So each of them have no invariance, have no non-trivial invariance subspace. So together they have no non-trivial invariance subspace. And also L1 of Z square plus L2 of Z square is also Z square. And so, the conjecture predicts that it should be at least four times the size of A. But if you just take to be an AP along the X axis, then after rotation by 90 degrees, they become an AP along the Y axis. And their sum is just twice the length. So we only get twice the size of A. Right, so so of course the issue is that we we cannot just get rid of those with the common invariant subspace, but we need to exclude those that sense an invariant subspace that sends a non-trivial subspace to another subspace of the same dimension. Uh, sorry, Jack. Um, yeah. can you hold your mic? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it got smaller again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So. 
right? So, and so we define that um, k linear transformations are irreducible if you cannot find non trivial subspaces u and v such that they have the same dimension and each of the li sends u to v. Okay, so this is uh, this is clearly necessary because if you can find such a subspace, then you can restrict all the linear transformation to that subspace and you get a lower dimensional problem. Right, and now for the, the second example here is the following. So let me try to use a whiteboard. Right, so for the second example, we have L1 to be this, and L2 is this, but also multiplied by this, which is a rotation by 90 degrees. And we take A to be uh, the following set. So, so basically the lattice square, but you scale, scale it vertically by two. So now we see that L1 of A will, will look like this, where now it's the lattice square, but you scale horizontally and vertically by two. And L2A is um, L1A, but rotated by 90 degrees. So it's the same set. And right now you can see that L1A plus L2 of A is this lattice grid, but now double in size. So it's roughly about four times the, four times of A, which is not what the conjecture predicts because they both have determinant two. So the conjecture predicts um, so determinant of two, so you take square root two plus square root two squared, which is eight. Did you write somewhere? I didn't see your handwriting over here. Oh, uh, I, I shared a- You can see it actually. Oh, really? Okay. Ah, uh, okay. So it's a matter of my screen size, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay, now let's go back to the slides. Yeah. Right. So um so the issue here is that both L1 and L2 have a common right factor here. The two zero zero one factor. And because of that, we can take A to be a set of a certain density such that L1 and L2 sends it to a set of a smaller density, right? Because we saw earlier that we started A with a set of density half and we ended up with a density one quarter. So, Remember that Booth's condition is that L1 of Z to D and so on equals Z to the D. It's actually equivalent to the fact that L1 to LK do not have a common left factor of determinant greater than one. So we can sort of combine these two examples to give a correct condition. So we say that they are co-prime if there are no invertible rational matrices such that the product of the determinant is between zero and one, such that you um, this you, you conjugate the L 
the LIs with P and Q, and they they all are, they are all still integer matrices. So basically, this is saying that you cannot start with a set of a certain density such that um, such that you end up with a set of a smaller density. Right, and this condition is also necessary because if you take A now, let's say in Q to the D, which is equivalent to in Z to the D, then we let A prime to be Q inverse A and we can manipulate it into the following form here. So we basically replace all the LIs with P, L, I, Q, and they all have smaller determinants. Right. So now we modify the conjecture to the following, where now our conditions are that they are irreducible and co-prime. And what we prove is that it's true for the two summon case. And our error term is of the form A to the power of one minus delta for some positive delta. Okay, so um, for the proof, we need um, we need the following uh, a discrete version of Bruno Minkowski. So this lemma says that if you have two sets A and B, then uh, the size of A plus B is at least um, the term here given by Bruno Minkowski minus some error term that minus the error term, which is, it depends on certain projections of A plus B. So, and this is proof using some compression arguments and uh, actually applying the continuous version of Bruno minkowski So I can give a sketch of the proof here with the whiteboard again. So can you see the whiteboard this time? Right, so, so let's say we start with a set A and it looks like this and here's B. And let, let's just consider in two dimension. So, um, so the first step is the compression step where basically you turn on gravity and you let the points fall down. And if the points land in the same spot, then they stack up. So when we compress it downward by turning on gravity downward, then the points become something like this. And for B, it becomes like this. And then after doing that, we turn on gravity to the left so that all the points now get stacked to the left. Right, so now we can assume that A and B are uh, in the, so now we can assume that A and B are in the natural square in this case. And they have to form like a staircase pattern. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, the compression doesn't increase the size of A plus B. That's why we can do that. So now that they are in uh, N square, we, we consider uh, for each point, we, we draw a box like this. Okay. So we draw a box where the corner on the top right is that point. And now the point set A plus B, in this case, it should look like, like this. Um, Let 
I think this one. Yeah, I think it looks like this. But if you look at the sum in terms of the, the solids formed by the boxes, we should get the following. plus an extra layer of boxes on the outside here. And so we can then we can apply the broom in Kowski to give that to give a lower bound for the volume of this set here. And you can see that the volume of this part here volume is exactly the size of A plus B. So the extra terms here are basically the different projections of A plus B. And that is the proof of the lemma. Is there any questions? Okay, so let's go back to the slide. Right, so that's the discrete broom Minkowski. So now let's try to prove the main theorem again. Uh, but we we just consider the case A plus L A. Because uh it's that's it, it it's easier to explain. So now the irreducible and co-prime condition is just basically now L not having a non-trivial invariant subspace. So in other words, it has to be invertible over Q. So the idea of the proof is to successive, successively improve the linear bound until we get the desired linear bound. And the way we do that, I'll explain later. So an important observation here is that L of Z to the D is a sub lattice. And the index of this sub lattice is the determinant. Right, so the way we improve the linear bound is by this so called bootstrapping lemma. So suppose we have managed to prove, suppose we managed to prove up to this term here, which is the desired bound minus some alpha. Okay. Now, if we break up A into, so you consider the different cosets of L of Z to the D and there are K of them because the determinant of L is K. And you break up A into K parts by intersecting with this coset. Now, if there is if there is such a coset whose size is between zero and A over K, then we get an improvement. So here the linear bound, we improve it. Okay, so and um, the way we, the way we improve the linear bound is so let's say suppose the size of a one is between zero and a over k. Now note that we can write a plus l a as a disjoint union as follows, because each of the l a lies in uh, in in the sub lattice and all the AIs belong to different cosets. And now we just bound each of this uh, sum. So for the first one, we bound by our discrete broom Minkowski. And for the rest, we just use our, our assumption that we have, that we have the following, that we have the, that we have a weak bound here. 
and you just combine them together and you get our result. So it, it works because the Bill Minkowski bound is stronger than our the the bound in our assumption, but only when the size of A1 is less than A over K here. So that's why we need that condition. Right, but um so but the bootstrap lemma is not enough to just keep improving the bound until we get what we want. Because it is possible that there is no such subset that is between zero and A over K. There will always be a subset of size less than A over K just by pigeonhole, but it could be empty. So in that case, um, we consider splitting each of the AI into even smaller cosets by considering the cosets of L squared. Then now there are three ways that help us improve the linear bound. So the first case is one of the AI splits into K non-empty cosets. Then because they're all non-empty, one of them has to satisfy this, has to satisfy the condition here required. Then we can apply our previous bootstrap, bootstrapping lemma to get an improvement in the bound. So another case is when A plus LA contains a coset that is different from all of this, all of the all of the cosets of the form AIJ plus LAIJ. So then this additional cosets will also give you an improvement in the bound. And the third case is when A is contained in some uh, some smaller sub lattice. Then in that case, we can just scale scale down A. So here, containing a small side, that just means that the affine Z span of A is not the whole of Z to the D. And then we can just scale scale down A. And the amazing, the amazing thing is that one of these things must always occur. So this can be formalized in the following lemma here. So we say that um, if you have a L that is invertible over Q, then you consider this abelian group Z over L squared z to the d over l squared z to the d, which are like the group of all our cosets. And you have x as a subset of them, which is meant to represent um, the cosets that contain, that intersect A. Then, one of the following occurs. So H in X is, is meant to say that um, X contains X contains this subgroup, which is to say that um, one of the 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 coset of L Z the coset of L Z to the D that contains zero splits into K non-empty cosets. And the second case here is to say that uh, A plus LA contains a coset that is different from all of, than all of A. And the third case is saying that uh, we can, it does not generate G, so we can sort of shrink down A. Right, 
and to get and with this lemma and what I described earlier, we can prove the following bootstrapping, the unconditional bootstrapping lemma. So we can just perform the bootstrap. We can improve the bound without any condition. So here we went from minus alpha to something that is smaller than alpha. Right, so this gives uh, the theorem a result for the case A plus LA. So, and the way, the way we get it from the bootstrapping is we just repeatedly apply the bootstrap uh, a suitable number of times. And you start with just this trivial bound here. So Jack, could you, could you compare the new bootstrapping lemma with the previous one? Yeah, so, so this is the old bootstrapping lemma. So the important difference is that in this bootstrapping lemma, we need this condition here that there is some j that this whole and for the unconditional bootstrapping uh, we don't need that condition although uh, but also uh, the improvement in the bound is slightly smaller I see. That, does, that doesn't matter Okay, so, right. So in order to get the, 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 the full linear term here, you apply the bootstrapping a suitable number of times so that the error, so that we can, so that the error term of the, so that we can get arbitrarily close to this. And the, the, the error term can be absorbed in, the error term of the linear term can be absorbed into the overall error term. Right. So that is the proof for the A plus LA case. And for in, in general, um, the idea is basically the same. So we start with a conditional bootstrapping lemma and then you prove a three cases lemma. And then from there, you prove a unconditional bootstrapping lemma. And that gives um, the general result here for L1A plus L2A. So about one thing to note is that this linear term is actually not optimal. It's only optimal for some L1 and L2. And the reason is that it's because the broom minkowski is not tight. So the broom minkowski for the broom minkowski equality to hold, we need L1A and L2A to be homothetic. But that's not always possible for, N, for arbitrary L1 and L2. So that's why it's actually not tight. So in order to get a tight bound, we need to define this constant here. So given a linear operator, you can define H of L to be the product of one plus the absolute value of all its eigenvalues. Then, um, a theorem by Krachen and Petrov. Um, for any set in R to the D, the volume of K plus LK is at least this constant times the volume of K. So we expect that uh, in the discrete case, 
this constant should also be optimal. So, so now uh, we, we can define this constant for uh, now integer integer linear transformation or rather for a rational one. So we so for a linear transformation L, you consider its minimal polynomial and you factorize it into linear terms. And uh, note that uh, we want it to be, we consider linear point, the minimum polynomial as a polynomial with integer coefficient. So if you get a monic rational polynomial, you just, you need to clear all the denominators. And the conjecture here is that um, for L1 and L2 of A, that this should be our the the optimal bound. So, for more than two summons, it's actually not not even known what the best linear bound is. Rather, there's not even a good reasonable guess for what the best linear bound should be. Okay, so uh, let's go back to um, some of dilates. So remember that the result by book, he showed that um, for some of integer dilates, he managed to prove the optimal bound. So now what about a plus l times, times a plus lambda times a, where now lambda is uh, arbitrary real number. So in order to solve, uh, uh, a simple lemma by Karchun and Petrov show that it suffices to just consider A in, in the number field formed by adjoining lambda. So now if, if lambda is algebraic, then this Q of lambda here is basically equivalent to Q to the D. And so this problem now becomes equivalent to, to bounding A plus LA for some uh, rational matrix L. Right, so, so to be more precise, um, so suppose lambda has this the following minimal polynomial and we view Q of lambda as a d-dimensional Q vector space with the basis one lambda, lambda square and so on. Then multiplication by lambda is just, is given by this linear transformation. And now the problem is now equivalent to bounding A plus LA for this L. So, but this L is still a rational, uh, has rational coefficients. So we just clear the denominators to make it integer. So to do that, uh, we let B be the integer that clears all the denominators of the, of the minimal polynomial. And then we let L1 and L2 be these two matrices which are integer matrices. So now the problem becomes equivalent to bounding L1B plus L2B. So now we just, now, now we just apply our theorem that we got earlier. But before we do that, we need to first show that this L1 and L2 are irreducible and co-prime. So, just based on the definitions alone, it's not clear. It's, it's not clear that, uh, how do 
how do you even decide whether two transformations are irreducible or cofine? But uh, in the two summon case, there's actually a very uh, simple classification. Right, so firstly for irreducibility, two matrices are irreducible if and only if the characteristic polynomial of P inverse Q is irreducible over the rational. So in our, in our specific case, uh, the characteristic polynomial of L1 inverse L2 is exactly the minimum polynomial of lambda, which is irreducible. So, and for the co-prime condition, we have the following result. So if P and Q are irreducible, then they are co-prime if and only if um, the, the determinant of P is the smallest positive integer that makes C times the characteristic polynomial of P inverse Q to be an integer polynomial. So in our specific case, um, this holds because the determinant of L1 is B, which is chosen to be the smallest positive integer that, uh, that makes CP an integer polynomial. Right, and together we get the following result here, which says that if lambda is an algebraic number with the following minimum polynomial. So now we want a polynomial with integer coefficients and we assume that they're all co-prime. Then the size of A plus lambda times A is at least the following. So one thing to know that this is only tight for lambda of the form P over Q to one over D. Right, so it's near the end of the presentation. So some open, open problems are, so the first one is obviously uh, the books original question for multiple summons. Another open, uh, another conjecture is uh, to prove for the two summon case, but with the optimal linear bound here. And a third open problem is just to find a, a good linear bound for multiple summons. And not even in the discrete case, but for the continuous case. Yeah, and that's all. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, do you have any questions? Yeah. No. Is there some uh, some kind of uh, stability result where if some set achieves some bound close to the bound, then you have certain structure? Um, so I think we can show that um, because we use the Bloom Minkowski inequality, so probably the optimal for for like an A that is close to the linear bound, we should have something like L1A and L2A have to be homothetic, I think.
Well, actually, yeah, maybe something like that, but uh, I don't have an exact. <laughs> exact stability uh, condition. Do you have any other questions? May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh. Can you please show the bootstrap lemma? Lemma? The last one. Sorry, which? The um, bootstrapping lemma? Unconditional. Yeah. Uh, bootstrapping lemma, yes. Yeah, this yeah. one. So the reduced coefficient cannot be reached to the intended the coefficient. So can we obtain the intended coefficient in finite step of unconditional to strip lemma? Uh, no, we can't get it in a finite number of steps because you see that each time this minus alpha becomes this, this constant times alpha. So it, it gets closer and closer to zero, but it never actually reaches zero. But then the coefficient of a to the one minus sigma one should be increased yeah, increased also, indefinitely. Yeah. This also uh, this error term here also increases. So I was a bit confused. Right. So so but you're confused on how to get the just this bound here. Yes. Right. So, so for our, our, our for the for the final lemma to get this bound, uh, this this constant here is actually different. So, we apply the bootstrapping lemma, uh, several times until we get something like one plus k to one over d to the d, uh, minus minus an epsilon times a and then minus some constant a to the one minus sigma. And then we sort of collect these two together into what, epsilon a plus c times a times one minus sigma. And if you, um, if you apply the bootstrapping lemma like a suitable number of times, you can make this epsilon here to be like about a to the one might a to the negative delta and this c here to be um sort of a to the a, a different epsilon prime so then we can combine these two together thank you does, does that make sense? It was helpful. Thanks. So I have a question. I wonder how much of the group can be saved to three summons? Uh, if, say, we know the continuous case, then the other part of what it goes through. Um, right. So, um, well, we know the continuous case for the Bloom Minkowski, but that doesn't actually give us the discrete version because, because of the, the way we apply the discrete Bloom Minkowski. We actually need like so we don't actually use the Bloom Minkowski for like A plus L A, but we actually use it for like in the A plus L A case, we use it for A1 plus 
L of A. So the, the continuous Bill Minkowski, the improved continuous bound here doesn't actually translate in the discrete manner, in, in, the, in the discrete version. So for the for the tree summon case, uh, this method here doesn't work because uh, because it because because it's hard to find it's hard to get a even just the conditional bootstrapping lemma because in in the so in our in this continuous bootstrapping lemma case, uh, the way we do it is we, we split A plus LA into disjoint sets here. And then we sort of bound each of them either by the discrete Bloom Minkowski or our earlier assumption. But for tree summon, for the tree summon case, there is no clear way to uh, break it up into the following form. So, so, so in, in the two sum case, we can bound like each of these by AK plus L of AK, right? But for the tree summon, we can't necessarily do that because like if L1 plus L2 plus L3 is just zero, then L1A plus L2A plus L3A we can't write it as a disjoint union of L1A prime plus L2A prime plus L3A prime for like over, over like different A primes because they all have to contain zero. <coughs> so yeah, the tree summon case is somehow harder and we, can't read a, can't even get a conditional bootstrapping lemma. Hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions? All right. Um, yeah, if not, then let's thank Jack again. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>